everyone can open their Qur'ans on their phones or have the Qur'an out in front of them. The verses that you will be needing for tonight's discussion are as follows. Chapter 17, verse 53. Surah Al-Isra, verse 53. Surah Al-Nahal, chapter 16, verse 125 chapter 16 verse 125 and surah at tawbah chapter number 9 verse number 79 that's chapter 9 verse 79 as a quick reminder to everybody the hadith of our sixth imam alayhi salam he is narrated to have said Allahumma salli ala Muhammad Man qara al Quran min al Mushaf. Whoever recites the Quran from its pages, meaning not its memory, to khafiful adab an walidehi, walau kana kafirain. Allah will lighten the punishment of his parents, even if his parents are disbelievers. So when you read the Quran from the pages, it has such an effect. So it is important that everybody does this, and we're trying to reform the values of the majlis here and become very Quran oriented so I encourage everyone inshallah to be able to do that you can have it in the Quran or on your phones or on your apps or however you wish to be able to do so for all of our marhumin if we can begin with the recitation of Surat Al-Fatiha أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين خاتم النبيين سيدنا الممجد بشير المصدق المصطفى الأمجد محمود الأحمد أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين ولعنة الله على الظالمين من الأولين والآخرين أما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه المجيد وفرقانه الحميد وقوله الحق بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وما كان المؤمنون لينفر كافة فلولا نفر من كل فرقة منهم طائفة ليتفقه في الدين ولينذر قومهم إذا رجعوا إليهم لعلهم يحذرون آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوا على محمد وآل محمد Awaited Savior of Humanity, Imam Al-Mahdi alayhi salam My respected teachers, elders, brothers and sisters Assalamu alaykum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh عظم الله جورنا وأجوركم بمصابنا أبي عبد الله الحسين صلوات الله وسلامه عليه. Tonight, as it is the night of Arba'in, we first and foremost, first and foremost, extend our condolences to the awaited Savior, Imam Al Mahdi عجل الله تعالى فرج الشريف. We ask Allah سبحانه وتعالى to grant us the tawfiq. Of performing the ziyara of Aba Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam, the ziyara of Arba'iniya next year, inshallah, and every year of our lives. And as a reminder, that tomorrow it is recommended for us to recite the ziyara of Arba'in. And so tomorrow afternoon we will have our program starting with Salat al Dhahr. It is highly encouraged that you and I try to attend so that we can make sure that we recite our ziyara. If for any reason you cannot attend here or any other Husseiniyah, then please take 
time out tomorrow afternoon to recite the ziyarah of Arba'in, which is readily available on Google, on dua.org, whatever you wish to be able to find it on. Our series concludes tonight, insha'Allah. We have been asking, what should the role of the pulpit be today? In the last couple of nights, we have spoken about the following important points. We stated that the Shi'i world has gone through a number of paradigm changes and that as a result of those paradigm shifts, the way in which knowledge has been brought about to the community has also shifted massively. Especially when you think about the Islamic revolution since 1979, we have been introduced to a plethora of new ideas and levels of understanding about Islam. Did we prepare accordingly for those shifts in knowledge, for the decentralization and the democratization of knowledge? We argued, in fact, no, we did not sufficiently prepare for that. And this is why often our audience is left in confusion when majalis is given because there is now a plethora of maraja and ulama that we are able to learn from. Yesterday, we talked about the principle that our ulama give to us that the ulama dhakirin must follow. Those who are on the pulpits have to work between two positions. The first is that there is what is known as wujub idhar al-ilm the necessity and obligation to make clear knowledge of Islam. And of course, there is also the hurma of kitman al-ilm, the prohibition of concealing the knowledge of Islam. So I have to make sure, and every alim has to make sure, that they are providing you with true, sound, detailed knowledge of Islam as per the needs of the community. On the other hand, there are certain restrictions. It is not a free-for-all that I am able to say what I want, however I want, whenever I want from the pulpit. On the other hand, there is the balance, which is known as daf ad I have to make sure that we do not put the community into harm's way, such that by what I say to you causes more problem than causes good actually creates more trouble from the community than actually resolves of their problems. Now we gave the example yesterday of His Eminence, Grand Ayatollah Sayyid Ali Hussein al-Sistani. May Allah preserve him for us. His Eminence Sayyid al-Sistani in February of 2019 wrote a letter regarding 10 points that were of concern to the community about what was coming from the pulpit. Amongst them, for example, he mentioned the issue of whether non-Shia and non-Muslims reach salvation. For example, the question of fiqhi issues, such as bulugh. There were many questions being raised from the pulpit, and sometimes the audience was finding that they were stuck because his eminence Sayyid Sistani had a particular position on this. And for the vast majority of the community, they had been used to hearing just one opinion for all of their lives. We gave the survey yesterday, we gave the specific percentages, we showed that more than 40% of the community, for the vast majority of their lives, has only ever heard one opinion from the pulpit. However, opposing that, 36% of the community had heard multiple opinions about the same mas'ala from the pulpit. So now what you find is that that 40 plus percent that are used to hearing one opinion about every issue, the moment that they've been introduced to a second opinion and a third opinion, it became confusing for them. They'd only ever heard the opinion, for example, of his eminence Sayyid Sistani. But when they were introduced to the opinion of, for example, Sayyid Al-Khumaini Rahmatullahi Ta'ala Alayhi or Ayatollah Kalim Shirazi or Ayatollah X or Ayatollah Y, 
they started to become very confused. They didn't know how to handle difference of opinion. And what we stated was that we've seen so much of ilm go forward and the ways in which our communities have been decentralized through knowledge, it is now against the waqir, the reality, to only ever tell a person one opinion when there is so many opinions available to them. The cat is out of the bag. You cannot put him back in now. Our youth, they're going into universities. They are learning at higher levels. Our youth in universities, when they join the Absocks, there is an Afghani Muslim. There is a Pakistani Muslim. There is a Khoja Muslim. There's an Iraqi Muslim. There's a Palestinian Muslim. There's a Syrian Muslim. There's an Iranian Muslim. And so they are immediately exposed to so many different opinions and ideas to restrict a person to just one thinking is against the reality of the times in which we live in. It is against the waqir. Now as a result of that, our community wrote to his eminence, Ayatollah Sistani, and said, multiple opinions that are against your blessed view, Sayyid Sistani, are coming from the pulpit. How do we deal with this? His eminence's office, and I reiterate, the office of Ayatollah Sistani, may Allah bless him, wrote back, by saying that these 10 opinions, they should not be discussed from the pulpit if they are going to cause division and disunity amongst the mu'mineen. Now we took one mas'ala from amongst that list yesterday. 10 problems that the community were facing from the pulpit. We took one as an example to show you. His eminence, for example, may believe that only Muslims receive salvation. May Allah bless him for his opinion. And his research. But you know that there are other maraji' that don't necessarily agree with this opinion. His eminence, Imam al-Khumayni, rahmatullahi ta'ala alayh, specifically says that it's not established that Christians and Jews will go to hell. Rather, there is the very real possibility that they will have their ajr. Ayatollah Jawadi Amuli has the same opinion. Ayatollah Mutahari has the same opinion and so on and so forth. Ayatollah Sayyid Muhammad Sayyid Fadlullah goes a step further and says there is absolutely evidence for them to get their ajr. Ayatollah Sayyid Kamal al-Haydari goes even a step further and says that they are mu'mineen. There's a difference of opinion. Ayat, we showed you yesterday, talk about this mas'ala very clearly from Surah Al-Imran. Ahl al-Bayt have spoken very clearly about this mas'ala. So why would his eminence grand Ayatollah Sayyid Sistani, may Allah bless him, tell the community not to speak about an issue that Marajit speak about, that Quran speaks about, that Ahadith speaks about. Is it normal for a Marja to say don't speak about other opinions of Marajit? No. If you went to his eminence Sayyid Sistani and said, can we talk about the opinion of Sayyid Khomeini in regards to this masala? Do you imagine he would say no? No. If you went to him and said, can we not speak about an ayah of the Qur'an? Are we restricted in speaking about Qur'an? He would say no. So why in this occasion did he restrict it from the pulpit? Because sometimes amongst certain communities, there are people who are so immature that when a mas'ala is being discussed, it becomes too hard for them to handle. They don't like it. Because they have a different opinion, or because they've only ever heard one opinion, the moment you present them with a second or third or fourth opinion, it shakes them. They don't like the idea of the presentation of another opinion. His eminence, or at least the office of Sayyid Sistani, was then forced to write a letter by saying, don't speak about these ten things from the pulpit. Can you see the problem? Can you imagine? Nowadays we are forcing the hand of a marja. To say, don't talk about Qur'an from the pulpit. Don't speak about a hadith of Ahlul Bayt from the pulpit. Why? Because we have not done ourselves justice. And we raised this point yesterday as the conclusion. And I want you to think about it as our starting point for us tonight to continue our series with. 1400 years ago when the ayah was revealed, 
No person jumped up against the Prophet and said, How dare you say there are good people amongst Jews and Christians? When the fifth Imam alayhi salam said, People who are non Shi'as without our wilaya go to heaven, and we quoted the hadith yesterday. No one of the companions from the fifth Imam jumped up and down and said, How dare you say uh, Sunnis go to heaven? When our ulama at the time began to record the ahadith, the earliest ahadith, none of them said, how could the fifth imam say this? They were all mature, illuminated people that could actually listen to these things. They were people who had just come out of ayam jahiliya, and they were able to handle these conversations. 1400 years ago, where some of the Shia have reached, even ayat of Quran and ahadith of Ahlul Bayt can no longer be spoken about. Is this what Shi'ism has become today? Is this how backwards we've gone? Not even to Jahiliyyah, behind Jahiliyyah. When illuminated souls removed themselves from Jahiliyyah, they were mature enough to be able to handle any conversation from the Imam, from Revelation. But today we have reached such a point where if we hear disagreement from each other, we immediately gun one another. We immediately want to throw people under the bus. In fact, subhanAllah, I saw a message from a particular WhatsApp group a couple of days ago. One person, may Allah bless him, you know what he said? This person who has a difference of opinion? Quote, may he be buried under the sand. This is a Shia saying this about another Shia for having a difference of opinion. Quote, may he be buried under the sand. Allahu Akbar. That's where we have reached. Think about it. Why not say... May Allah guide him. May Allah help him to be back within the fold of the, you know, the, the, the normative thinking. This is where we have reached. And we really have to think about these things, about how much we are cutting each other up, how much we are destroying our unity from within on the basis of these matters. It takes a more enlightened soul than a darkened soul to be able to deal with these matters in a more positive way. And this is, inshallah, what we're going to be discussing tonight, our conclusion to our series. Now, the conclusion is going to be asking the following questions. How do we balance ourselves between the limitations that the pulpit has as well as the new expectations that are being placed upon the pulpit. Limitations are there, and we need to enumerate them tonight. But at the same time, you will see that there is more and more demand from the pulpit, isn't there? Being asked for it to be able to raise the level of discussion. How do we balance ourselves between these two opposing positions? This will be our discussion tonight, with your permission and allowed salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Oh. What we're going to do first and foremost is we need to be able to go back to our survey to be able to show what the thinking is of the community and how they have responded to certain questions. So as you know, we did a survey. We asked everybody to be able to participate and we had almost 400 people from the community reply back to the survey. So I believe it is a good number. It is a starting point for us to be able to see what people are thinking. So we're going to start with question number 20, inshallah, and then 21 and 26. And, and as, as I, I said, said, maybe many of you have actually replied to the survey. And so you will think about the answers that you gave to the survey, inshallah, and have a look at how others have answered it as well. So you remember earlier on, I mentioned that 36% of the community, they hear multiple opinions. More than 40% of the community said that they either rarely or never hear more than one opinion of the community. Question number 20, it is on the screen for you, inshallah. The question to you, my dear audience, was what limitations, if any, do you think the pulpit should have? 2.3% said the pulpit should not speak about contemporary issues. 
should not speak about contemporary issues. So obviously, the other percentage disagrees. Almost 10% said it should, speak, it should not speak about politics. Which as you know, that there are some Shia that don't agree that politics is part of Islam. And so they don't want to hear about what's happening in the real world in front of them. I'll tell you a story. This is five, six years back. I forget exactly. I had the honor of reti- reciting for our fifth Imam, Muhammad al-Baqir, salawatullahu wa alayhi. Oh. Oh. And it was on the cusp of the Brexit vote. Now, I think everybody knows now what damage Brexit is doing to the country. If you don't already, just go to your local supermarket, go to your local petrol station, and you'll see what damage is happening. Yeah? The fifth Imam, alayhi salam, many of you might know, introduced the first ever coin in the Islamic Ummah. Do you know this? Yes? Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam. It's actually here. The coin is still available in London here until today in the museums, in the British Museum. Now what's interesting is because Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam established the first distinct economic policy in the Ummah, having then explained some of his biographical accounts, how he did this, the effect that he had on the ummah, for the next 20 minutes of the majlis, I, as you know, I speak about politics quite often, I then explain what is Brexit, what are the harms, and some guidance that may be able to help the community navigate what was, of course, going to be a very sticky issue. I came down from the pulpit, and one youth came to me, and he said, quote, I didn't go to work all day and listen to things about Brexit all day to have to come to the pulpit and listen to it about Brexit as well. And I said, I understand. It's a bit overwhelming. It's a lot, you know. Right now we're in the middle of the pandemic. If I keep speaking about the pandemic, you know, I've been living it for 18 months, brother. You know, relax now. I'm done, you know. When you're hearing every day about Brexit, if you come and listen to the pulpit as well, I said, brother, what you have to understand is Islam is not divorced from real world issues. You need guidance as to how to vote on this matter because it's going to affect you very quickly. This is having a real world impact. No, I don't want to hear about this. I just want to hear the biography of Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam. He said, may Allah bless him. Maybe he's right. Maybe I'm wrong. I said to him, dear brother, go on to YouTube. Click it, type in the name Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam, you will find 500 lectures on his biography. But I guarantee you will not find one lecture from a Shia speaker telling you how to navigate the issues of Brexit. So 10% said that the pulpit should stay away from politics. Now this one is the interesting one that I want you to, to focus on. It should stick to one opinion. The pulpit should stick to one opinion. Now, what did I say? 36% said that they regularly hear multiple opinions. 45% said they almost never hear multiple opinions. The question was, should the limitation be placed on the pulpit that it only ever hears one opinion? 1.8% of people said yes. That's a total of four people from the entire survey said, yes, only stick to one opinion of Amaraj al kira I'm going to suggest, humbly, that those leaders of our community that want to box you into only ever understanding and hearing one opinion are doing you a disservice. Moreover, the evidence comes from the audience themselves, you, that that's not what you want. The next question, which came from the survey about the pulpit, refers back to what we said about the balance between the wujub of idhar al-ilm, making clear knowledge, and the hurma of dharar, or Making sure that I don't say something that harms the community, divides the community. The audience was asked, should the pulpit be allowed to create controversy? Now we gave examples yesterday, 
when, for example, his eminence, uh, Imam al-Mujahid, Sayyid Khamenei, caused controversy with his fatwa. Marhum Mullah Azghar, rahmatullahi ta'ala alayhi, caused controversy from the pulpit by telling people that this culture of things when, you know, Imam al uh, Qasim ibn al-Hassan alayhi salam supposedly got married, that this never happened and we cannot create a culture off the back of a fabricated event, it caused controversy. But there's times when it has to create controversy. So the question we posed was, should the pulpit be able to create controversy? 13% said never. Now we mentioned yesterday in the Quran, even Ibrahim alayhi salam created controversy in his community. Right? When they saw that the big idol was left and the smaller ones were smashed to bits, said, who did this? Ibrahim alayhi salam said, ask the big idol if he can speak. The Quran said, فَرَجَعُوا إِلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ For the first time they introspected on the reality of their beliefs. For them it was controversial. Sometimes the pulpit has to create controversy in order to protect the religion or maybe even to protect the believers in the religion. 36% said it depends on the audience's capacity to understand the matter as to whether controversy should be created. 58% said if there's a cultural practice that is not correct, then we should intervene. 66% said if there's a community issue that needs intervening. And 60% said yes, if it is to change a divisive or dangerous behavior from the community. Question number 26 asks the follow-up question. Sometimes we get controversial speakers. What is your opinion about banning a speaker? Now look at the question. The question is very important. I'm not talking about speakers that go outside of Shiism. Someone who is outside of Shiism, we have to do due diligence on whether we can invite them or not. There are certain speakers that we will say they are very dangerous. There is one individual, Yasir Habib, if you said to me, can we bring him from the pulpit? I would say, no, do not bring him to the pulpit. This person has gone too far. We have to have boundaries on what the pulpit can and cannot say. There has to be daf al darar We cannot have a free-for-all on the pulpit. The question is, what is your opinion on banning or not giving a platform to a speaker based on his or her opinion? If his opinion is obscure, it may not be popular, but is the minority, but it's still within the spectrum of Shi'ism. 22% said, if the marja bans that person, then we should stick to the guidance of the marja. 5% said, it depends basically on the executive committee and the elders of the community. And 50% said, no, as long as it's within Shi'ism, Legitimately within Shi'ism, we should be able to hear the opinion and make judgment for ourselves. And this is something that we mentioned that the Quran says, الَّذِينَ يَسْتَمِعُونَ الْقَوْلِ Those who listen to the opinion, فَيَتَّبِعُونَ أَحْسَنَهُ And they follow what is best. This was the principal moral guidance that we gave from the Quran. So this is some of the guidance and some of the discussions that are at hand and it gives you some idea as to what people are thinking about in accordance with some of the challenges of the time. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Okay. Now we go into the next part of our discussion. And that is to think about how we navigate the limitations of the pulpit before we go into the areas of the growth that the pulpit should be going into. The first thing I'm going to state is a statement that was given to me by one of the alima, alimas, a female scholar of the community when I was preparing for this series. So I called and I was talking to her about her opinion. And she said something very beautiful, very important. She said, sometimes we are trying to make the pulpit into something that it essentially is not. She said, if you have a cup that can only hold 300 milliliters of water, 
you cannot pour into it one liter of water. You understand? You cannot ask the pulpit to do more than its capacity. And you cannot ask the pulpit to do more than its limitations. Which means we do have to discuss what those limitations are within the brackets of Daf'a Darar. Making sure that we do not do harm to a community through the majlis of Ahl al-Bayt. Salawatullah wa salamu alayhi majma'een. What are the first sets of limitations that we have to be able to understand in this context? The first thing is that we have to realize is that the pulpit is not a hausa. This pulpit is not a hausa. A hausa is something different. And we cannot turn the pulpit into the hausa. And the reason for that is that the hausa is for a certain standard of people who are going through diligent training with prerequisite knowledges. The pulpit has to assume that those people in the audience do not have those knowledges, those prerequisite knowledges. And so you cannot turn this into a different institution. It has to be the institution that it is. Now we've been arguing that you have to raise the level of the pulpit, which we'll come to in the latter third of this discussion tonight, inshallah. But you cannot make it into something that it is not. This is the first thing. The second thing is that we have to remember that when it comes to different types of lectures, we have to realize that sometimes what we ask for isn't always what we need. Let me give you an example. Sometimes we say that I want a lecture to be deep. Sometimes we say, I want it to be of high level. Those two things are not the same thing. High level and of depth are not the same thing. And you have to know this. If I give you a high level lecture, it may be that I'm giving you language that you may not necessarily be accustomed to. If I talk to you about logical principles, for example, you may have never heard of them. It's high level for you. And you won't be able to make sense of some of the language. For example, it may be some of you in the audience don't understand deductive reasoning or inductive reasoning. If I start to be debating deductive reasoning and inductive reasoning with you, you might get lost. It's high level. You don't always necessarily need a high level lecture. But what we do need is a lecture with depth. The other night when we were commemorating our uh, istishhad of our second Imam, Hassan al-Mujtaba, salawatullah wa salamuhu alayhi. We quoted a unique hadith where Imam al-Hassan alayhi salam gives advice to one of his greatest companions, an extraordinary companion. Do you remember it? It was such depth from the Imam that we would have taken weeks to discuss this one hadith. At the end of it, what did you say to me? You said this was so deep, can you send me the hadith? The hadith, we didn't get lost in the hadith, right? But it was still in depth. There's a difference between depth and high level. We have to understand this. Number two, we also have to understand that there's a difference between that which is educational and that which is spiritual. One of the questions that I asked on the, on the survey was, is the pulpit fulfilling your educational needs? And the vast majority of people said, no. In Islam, there is a difference between education and spirituality. And what's important to note is that in Western understandings of the education system, education is about as many facts as you can possibly have. Paulo Freire there's a wonderful book by the name of Pedagogy of the Oppressed. I highly recommend it to you. And you know what? He criticizes Western education system. You know what he says? It's like a banking system. You know, in a bank, what you do is you deposit. And when you want to take something out, you take it out. When you're finished, you redeposit, you take it out. 
Islamic education is not like that. Facts, numbers, digits are not important for you. Really. You can learn everything about facts in history. It doesn't necessarily make it that you've grown from that history. You understand? The pulpit is not like a Western education system. It is about spirituality as well as education. And all of the ilm has to turn into amal. As much ilm as you possess, you want to be able to translate it into practical action for you. If I come and tell you all about Sahifa Sajjadiyya and you walk away going, MashaAllah, wonderful lecture, Kya baat hai, Nare Haydari, and at the end of it, you don't recite one dua from Sahifa Sajjadiyya, Allah is my witness, I'd rather have not given you the lecture. What good is it? What, what good is it for you? We're not here for entertainment. We're not here to slap our thigh and make people jump up and down with poetry. That's not the goal. Yes, on certain occasions we have to be uplifted. But the goal of the pulpit is to raise you spiritually. If it is not raising you spiritually, then the pulpit is failing you. And so is the speaker. So we have to understand that there are differences between these things. Now we go back to the point about that the Hausa or the pulpit is not a Hausa. And we found out through our series, people are craving higher level knowledge. What did I say? Not depth. They're craving higher level knowledge. They are craving questions. They want to go deeper into tafsir, into ahadith studies, into aqaidi studies. And this is what the pulpit also has to understand. That it has to be able to invest in those resources for people to be able to go that step higher. There is a desire for it. There's a huge thirst for higher level knowledge. Each community needs to have private classes. It has to have it available to people. So that you can have those higher level discussions for people that are craving it so that they don't get bored from the pulpit. And that it raises the entire community slowly, slowly, slowly because there are groups of people that are coming for more than just what the pulpit gives to everybody. It gives it to higher level classes as well. Think about this for a second. We have members of our, of our executive committee here. Just give me a figure. How much do we invest per annum in our madrasa? It doesn't matter. I'm not asking for a figure. It's a rhetorical question because we've got people watching from across the world. 1,000, 10,000, 50,000 a year. Youth need to be invested in. How much do we invest in adult learning? Can you see? You see the imbalance? There are people that are craving... We, we see it. People are craving higher level knowledge, deeper discussions, so that they can actually be taken higher. Where is the investment? It's almost nil, isn't it? Almost nil. It's a complete imbalance. No wonder people are going elsewhere. No wonder they're going to scholars that provide them with different levels of insight, provide them with different opinions of Maraja al kiram because if you're not going to give it again, as I said yesterday, they're going to go elsewhere. Don't blame the audience for whoever thirst of knowledge that when you don't provide it to them, they go elsewhere. Of course, they'll go elsewhere. Failing from our community. Now, there are certain institutions and ulama that you can find that have good uh, introductory Hausa level classes available to you. Arguably, the scholar in our community that is doing the most for that is His Eminence Sheikh Muhammad Ali Shamali. May Allah bless him for his work. Go onto his YouTube page, you will find book after book after book from the Hawza Ilmiya, where he is talking through the whole book in English, explaining it to you. Go to his website, go, go to his YouTube page. 10. 15 different Hausawi books from the most basic to the intermediary available for you. Islamic College in London teaching junior or introductory to middle grade Hausa. Al-Mahdi Institute teaching from junior 
in, uh, basic to intermediary and higher level Hawzai books. Other scholars are also got it. You've got Iqra online. You've got Tasneem Institute. All of these different places are giving you, providing you. All the scholars need to be providing something higher than just majlis for its community, inshallah. Now, this is some of the points about some of the restrictions that the pulpit needs to be able to have upon it. And I'll give one last one before we move into the last part of our series, which talks about pushing the pulpit forward, seeing the growth. The last restriction that I'll place on the pulpit in my humble experience and advice to the scholars and to you as the audience. When the pulpit wants to take you higher, when it wants to provide you with more depth, at times it needs to be able to do more background work expressing background issues before it gives you the conclusions. Let me give an example. Let's say I want to talk to you about the reality of some of the events of Karbala. If I start talking to you about which daughters exist, sometimes for some communities it can become a very painful conversation. Historically, and we talked about this on a previous night, historically, only Sukaina bint al Hussein and Fatima bint al Hussein existed. Latter developments in history brings another daughter by the name of Ruqayya. So we have three daughters. My community, our community, commemorates a young girl by the name of Sakina bint al Hussein. It might be that it's difficult to provide proper historical evidence for a daughter by the name of Sakina. Now for some people, that's going to be very new and very tough for them to hear. The earliest literature talks about a child, a baby, a baby being murdered on the 10th of Muharram. As the history develops, as the collection of ahadith develops, we begin to see more detail being ascribed to that baby. We then get an age, six month old. We then get a name later on, for example, Abdullah ar radi We later on get another development in later parts of the compilation of our ahadith that, it, that he was killed by an arrow. Later on, we see a three pronged arrow. Now, again, this may be new for some people, it may be tough. What I'm saying is that if I come on the 10th night of Muharram, which is an emotional night and just tell you that there's only a baby at the very beginning and I ignore everything else, I will be doing a disservice to the pulpit and to my audience. It's not the right time, not the right place. Correct? It's not the right time, not the right place for that academic bath. It's not. I'm saying it three times. But when the alim decides to address these points, whatever historical points there are and we know today we have lots of debates the door on Fatima alayhi salam all these historical debates are coming up coming up you can't shy away from them first bring it as a series explain to the audience how history works the development of a hadith how hadith was collected what are our, our earliest compilations of hadith what does it say Provide them the reading so they know for themselves. Provide them the middle ground of a hadith that comes a few, you know, a few centuries later. And then provide them the later a hadith, the ones that comes 1100 years later. Like Bihar and Anwar. Bihar and Anwar, may Allah bless Alama Majlisi, a giant figure. We are not the dust underneath the dust underneath the dust underneath his feet. But his compilation of a hadith is 1100 years after the Prophet Therefore, what's going to be recorded 1100 years later is going to be very different to what's recorded 150 years after the Prophet. Do you understand? Logic, yes? Sometimes you have to show the background to people. Help them. I don't like it when speakers come and they say, with 40 minutes, I'm going to tell you everything about this topic. 
Baba, even the Qur'an took 23 years to be revealed about the same story. How many times do you hear the story of Musa alayhi salam in the Qur'an? For 23 years, Allah repeated it, repeated it, expanded upon it. Repeated it, expanded upon it. Showed you one angle, showed you another angle. If Allah understands how to do this, why does a speaker come and say, in 40 minutes, I'm going to dissect everything for you? You're greater than Allah? You're greater than Allah's method of revelation? Speakers have to be able to understand how to navigate these things. Sometimes they do a disservice. They have to understand the limitations that are upon them from the pulpit. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. So now, as we come to our uh, next point, which is the last part of our series for the entirety of our time, inshaAllah. For this discussion, we are talking about the question of how the pulpit should grow and what the pulpit should do to move forward. I'm going to ask my wonderful assistant to be able to go back and show us the survey and to show us what you yourselves have asked for in terms of the pulpit and then to be able to mention how some of the ayat and ahadith deal with the growth of the pulpit. So we're going to start with question number 22, insha'Allah. And again, we can see the series of questions is asking us how we think about the pulpit moving forward. So everyone can see, insha'Allah, question number 22. It asks the following. Should the pulpit engage in critical thinking? Should you be able to critique matters from the pulpit? Less than 1% said never. So only two people out of almost 400 said the pulpit should never talk about critical thinking or should use critical engagement. It depends on the audience, 33%. 48% yes, if the opinions are outdated or false scholarly, scholarly opinions. 50% said yes, if it's a wrong interpretation of a text, we need to interpret the text again. And 77% said yes, as long as both or many sides of the argument are presented. So the vast majority of the audience wants critical thinking on the premise that so long as you present multiple opinions, then you are better informed than you were at the beginning of it. Question 23. Should the pulpit bring forward higher level debates? Again, 1.33% said never, depending on the audience. 33% said yes, we should analyze the chains of narrations to verify whether the hadith is sound or not. 44% said yes, we should have more scholarly evaluations of matters. 53% said we should have more contemporary debates on issues. 56% said we need more explanation of methodologies that ulama use. We want to know what the methodology Sayyid Sistani has used to reach his conclusion. So we're not following it blindly, we understand it. His Eminence, Grand Ayatollah Sayyid Muhammad Taqi al Mudarrasi, may Allah preserve him, told me directly this is a first hand conveyance of this story to you. When he wrote his Risala Amaliya, the Risala that we use for fatawa, he included in it his istidlal. What's an istidlal? The proofs that he used to be able to reach his conclusions. It's not a full istidlal, it's a basic istidlal. Here's some ayat, here's some ahadith. You know what he said to me? He said, the reason why I did this was particularly for your community in the West. Because when you tell someone in the West to do something, they won't just follow it blindly. They want to know why they do it. So I wrote a risala with the evidences and not just the rules that you had to follow. Can you see that? Maraje are beginning to understand these points, beginning to publish their risala with their istidlal, 
for everyone to be able to see. And so this is why even 56% of the audience asked for the same thing. Next question, 24. What are the three central qualities that you look for in a speaker? This one was quite interesting for me, and I'm sure it'll be quite interesting for you as well. Number of qualifications, subhanAllah. Only 20% of you look for qualifications in your speaker. I would have thought that that should have been 100% of you. 8 out of 10 of you didn't say you're looking for a qualified speaker. Do you understand the problem? Surely the first thing that you should look for from someone on the pulpit is that he or she is qualified. Only 4% of you are looking to see that if he's actually got publications, that his work can be scrutinized by his peers. 50% of you said that you're looking for a speaker with oratory power. Forty percent of you said that you're looking for someone who's a specialist in a matter. So now, if we're not looking for qualifications and non-specialisms, sixty percent we're left with people who can talk to you, but without any proper experience about a particular topic. I'm going to leave this for you to be able to think about in your own time, inshallah. Question twenty-five: How should the pulpit? Take the community forward. This is how we're going to talk about the last points of this series. Because we want to talk about the progress of the pulpit. Where should it be going? Question 25. How should the pulpit take a community forward whilst accounting for multiple levels of knowledge and interest? 1.8% of you said the pulpit is not the right place to take the community forward. 5% said... You should just stick to the basics of Islam. 8% said we shouldn't have to wait for those people who are uninterested in being taken forward. I said this yesterday. When His Eminence said Khamenei gave his fatwa, and I said I'm not agreeing with the fatwa or disagreeing with it. But when he gave his fatwa against Zanjir, and some people in India, and I said I saw this with my own eyes and heard this with my own ears, they started to do Zanjir whilst doing La'na against Sayyid Khamenei to spite him not out of love of Imam Hussein alayhi salam they're doing Zanjir was doing La'an not of Yazid of the Marja I said don't wait for these people don't 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 wait for these people you carry on he, you just carry on it doesn't matter 32% said it should present the widest range of topics 52% said it should focus on methodology and framework by how to be able to interpret it okay you know, when we come to take our community forward, there is advice from our holy Ahlul Bayt. First and foremost, the Holy Prophet of Islam, Rasulullah Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. And I'm going to emphasize this all to you, and especially to parents. Please make a note of this. Okay? This book is al ihtijaj by Allama Tabrasi, Rahmatullahi Ta'ala Alayhi, one of our greatest scholars. Okay? Now, in this hadith, our Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Ali, the beginning of the hadith, what the title of the hadith is, Rasala li Abi Jahl ila Rasulillahi, Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Ali, Lamma Hajra ila Madinati, Wal Jawabu Anha bi Riwayati an Abi Muhammad al Hassan al Askari Alayhi Salam. Abu Jahl wrote a letter, a horrible, scathing letter to our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi and the Prophet gives a jawab in Medina and the hadith is related from our 11th Imam Hassan Al-Askari Sallallahu Alaihi Wa It's a lengthy hadith, I'm only going to give you two lines and I'm going to suggest that this is the first thing that the pulpit has to do to move forward ثم قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله يا معشر المسلمين O gathering of Muslims Now tell me, when the Prophet speaks does he only speak to his immediate audience or does he speak to all Muslims? One more time 
Are you sure? Okay. You're going to hang yourself at the end of this, huh? Ya ma'ashar al-Muslimin wal Yahud iktabu bima sami'tum Write what you have heard. Faqalu, they responded, the Muslims and the Yahud responded, Ya Rasulullah, sami'na wa wa'ina. We, we hear and we're going to pay attention. Wala nansa. And we won't forget what you have to say, Ya Rasulullah. Faqala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi Writing is going to be more beneficial for your remembrance. It's going to be better for you to be able to remember discussions. So at this point, they respond. Ya Rasulullah, Where is the ink pot and pen? Even Imam Ali alayhi salam is a hadith where he says, write, for if you write, you will not forget. Now, parents, tell me something. If your children went to school without a pen and a pad, be honest with me. What would you say? Be honest, what would you say? Going for a say again? Going for a holiday. Ahsan. Are you going for a holiday? <laughs> like, Seriously? Do you also put your feet up on the desk? Are you chilling? If your child went to madrasa without a pen and paper, what would you say to them? You wouldn't say. You wouldn't tell them to write stuff down at madrasa. Practices we don't say anything. If this is going to be the central place of learning for your community, then you have to take it seriously. It baffles me. Allah is my witness. It baffles me that people come to the majlis to hear ayat and ahadith of Ahlul Bayt alayhim wasalam and they don't bring a pen and pad. It baffles me, I swear to you. If I go in the majlis of someone else, I'm always writing down what I hear. It surprises me that our audience, the parents, allow their children to come to the pulpit, and they don't take notes of what they hear. When the Prophet says, it is adhkaru lakum. It's better for your dhikr, for your remembrance for you. We said that the way the Prophet raised an entire civilization was first through iqra wal qalam. First two chapters of the Quran, iqra wal qalam. Read and Right. Someone will say, but they were illiterates. The Prophet is saying, right. They couldn't have been illiterates. Can you see that? My humble advice to you, if you want to move the pulpit forward, right. Number one. Number two. Ground. And this is to my beloved speakers who are out there listening. Ground the Quran on the pulpit. Allah is my witness, I have seen speakers, Shia, Dhaqirin, sit on the pulpit and for 45 minutes don't mention a single ayah of the Qur'an. فَأَيْنَ تَذْهَبُونَ Honestly, they'll bring every hadith, لا أَصْلًا لها. There's no grounding for the hadith, but they don't know a single verse of the Qur'an. I'll say this and I'll say this again and again. The only thing that is protected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the Qur'an. The Qur'an. The hadith is not protected by Allah. It needs due diligence to know what is sound and what is not. What to use and when to use it. The Qur'an is protected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is absolutely perfect. Ground yourselves in the Qur'an. This is my second humble advice. My third humble advice comes to the ayat that I've asked you to be able to open on your Qur'ans if you'll kindly revert back to them. And I mentioned to you that when you as the audience hear different opinions, you should choose the best of them. The pulpit has to be a place of certain principles. 
the Quran, it has to be God centric and it has to be that it is a place of morality. The first person who needs to be moral on the pulpit is the speaker himself. If the speaker himself is not using the highest level of morality on the pulpit, if the way in which he is speaking about other speakers is by name calling and takfir and other things, then the audience is going to be lost as well. Because that's what they're going to think the akhlaq of the pulpit is. It needs to be rooted in moral speech. The first ayah I asked you to look at was chapter number 17, verse 53. If you open your Qur'ans, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَقُلْ And say. It's a command. وَقُلْ So say it. Tell it to people. لِعِبَادِي To my servants. يَقُولُ الَّتِي هِيَ أَحْسَنْ Say to my servants to say that which is best. When you have speakers doing takfir, belittling, lying about other people's opinions, misrepresenting other people's opinions, فَبِئْسًا لَكُمْ وَبِئْسًا لِقَوْلِكُمْ When you have speakers that are honest and moral characters here, then this is in accordance with the expectation of the Qur'an. يَقُولُ الَّتِي هِيَ أَحْسَنُ Why? إِنَّ الشَّيْطَانَ يَنْزَغُ بَيْنَهُمْ Indeed, when it is not moral, when your speech is not grounded in ethics and how you deal with matters from the pulpit, إِنَّ الشَّيْطَانَ يَنْزَغُ بَيْنَهُمْ You will see that shaitan sows discord between yourselves. Don't you realize inna shaytana kana lil insani aduwan mubina? The next ayah that I wanted you to see is a very famous one, chapter 16, verse 125. Ud'u ila sabiri rabbika bil hikmati wal mawdi'atil hasana. Allah says, Call towards the way of your Lord with wisdom and goodly instruction. And lastly, the ayah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah At Tawbah, verse number 79. الذين يلمزون المطوعين من المؤمنين في الصدقات والذين لا يجدون إلا جهدهم فيسخرون منهم. You know there were people at the time of the Prophet, hypocrites. When they saw a poor person giving only a little bit of sadaqa, they used to mock them. They didn't realize that's all the poor person could give. If you could only give one date, Hani and Lakum, good for you, give that one date. You know what the hypocrites used to do? They used to find fault with the believers who used to give only a little bit. And they used to mock them for that effort that they put in. Speakers, when you see people giving different levels of majalis, different levels of output, don't belittle their efforts. Don't mock their efforts. And you'll see this. Speakers themselves have to work from a moral grounding. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, those people who mocked the efforts of others, Allah mocks them. We have to make sure the pulpit is grounded in the highest levels of morality. You'll see in the last survey slides that what you have asked for is very important. And that is from question number 7 to 11. And you have asked for a movement in the pulpit. Question seven, select four primary functions of the pulpit. And you can see what people have answered. I don't want to take longer than I have, so I'm going to skip through it. Question number eight, what learning methods should there be from the pulpit? Question nine, what processes should the pulpit use? Only 11% of you said it should be purely monologue. 70% of you said the pulpit should be dialogue. Where we're talking together, I'm asking you questions. 36% of you said you wanted slides. 52% said you want to be able to read the verses of the Qur'an for yourself, like I ask you to open the Qur'an for yourself. 
only 15% of you said that you want the notes to be given to you in advance. I give you the ayat and the ahadith so you can take it away. You know why? Because the rest of you said you want to start writing things down for yourself. 31% of you said that you actually want videos in the majlis. And I've trialed this in certain places. One place, I showed them a video, they almost ran me out. Other places, they actually want a video to break up the lecture. 32% said that they want live polls to ask you a question for your engagement in it. 52% said that you want interaction through questions. You can ask, submit questions privately. So I don't know who's asking. You might be embarrassed to ask a question. It comes up on the screen privately. 48% of you said that you want to see books as references. And you know I often bring books in order to be able to present work. 15% of you said that you want homework. Who amongst you were the nerds? that said that you actually want homework from the pulpit. May Allah bless you. I think some of you know I actually do give homework from the pulpit. And 46% of you said that you want Q&As. We have to realize that the pulpit is moving forward. And I've done this series primarily for three reasons. One, because we've reached the point where speakers are fighting with each other too much on the pulpit the audience is now collateral damage. This needs to stop. And I had to be brave enough to address them. And I know I'll get the slack for it. And I know multiple videos of hate will come out at the end of it. Barakallah fikum. Number one. Number two. The second is that you as the audience deserve better from the pulpits. This is important. I gave the example that if you have a 300 milliliter cup, you cannot pour a liter into it. If this is a 300 milliliter cup, at the moment we are only giving you 100 milliliters. We're not doing you the service that you deserve from the pulpit. There needs to be better content and depth. And we all need to improve ourselves by our learning and our research to get you there. But thirdly, we also needed to know how to get there. And that's why this series has shown us some of the finer points, such as multiple opinions, such as the adawat, the tools by which we can use the pulpit to gain the levels of education and spirituality that we are looking for. I conclude with the statement of His Eminence, Grand Ayatollah Sayyid Muhammad Hussein Fadlullah Rahmatullahi Ta'ala Alayhi. Sayyid Fadlullah said, and I read this out to you on the first night of this series. Sayyid Fadlullah said, don't let your pulpits be a place where you are sending arrows on each other. Your pulpits should be a place where you are sending arrows to the enemies. I will go a step further and I will say to you, we have reached the point where we are shutting down our majlises by virtue of the attacks on each other. Do you want to know when your majlis is truly a success? When the enemy comes to stop your majlis. When the enemy knows that your majlis is actually finally hitting the bullseye when it's shaking the enemy and they no longer allow you to speak on the pulpit and they pull you down, know that actually that is when your majlis is truly making the effect that it needs. You'll say to me, what's the evidence? Ja'far, you said, always ground yourself, Quran, ahadith, sound ahadith. Where's your evidence? In Damascus, in the court of Yazid, la'natullahi alayhi, Imam al-Sajjad gave a sermon that brought everyone to tears. And do you know how they stopped it? Yazid had to call for an adhan to be able to stop the sermon of Imam al-Sajjad When the enemy has to stop your sermon, when the tyrant has to stop the sermons of Ahl al-Bayt from the pulpits, then you know you're fully reaching the cup 
of the pulpit, and not until then. Picture the scene, if you will. Imam al-Sajjad is bound by shackles. Imam al-Sajjad has been made to walk from city to city. Imam al-Sajjad has been made to have stones being thrown at him. Imam al-Sajjad has had boiling water poured over him. Imam al-Sajjad has had sticks made of fire set alight thrown at him. Yet Imam al-Sajjad will deliver the most potent speech that will cause tumult in the entirety of the ummah such that it relieves them and grants them their freedom. On that day, Imam al-Sajjad had the opportunity to take the pulpit. There was a preacher singing the praises of Yazid and Muawiyah. When he finished, Imam al-Sajjad said, Can I now go on the pulpit? The people insisted that Imam al-Sajjad gets the pulpit. Yazid responded by saying, But these are the people who were fed knowledge and wisdom whilst they were still suckling as children. If I permit Ali ibn al Hussein to speak, he will disgrace me in front of the people. But with the insistence of the people, eventually Imam al Sajjad ascended to the pulpit and he began by saying, O people, Allah has given us six things and our superiority over others is based on seven pillars. To us belongs Hamza and Ja'far. To us belongs Asadullah, the Lion of Allah, Ali ibn Abi Talib. To us belongs the leaders of the youth of paradise, Imams Al-Hasan and Hussein. Whoever recognizes me knows me, and whoever does not recognize me, then let me tell you who I am and which family I belong to. I am the son of Makkah and Mina. I am the son of Zamzam and as Safa. I am the son of the best man to ever put on the loincloth. I am the son of the best man who performed tawaf and sa'i running between Safa and Marwa. I am the son of the best man who pronounced the Hajj and Talbiyah. I am the son of him who traveled from the sacred mosque to the farthest mosque. I am the son of the one who was taken by Jibra'il to Sidratul Muntaha. I am the son of the one who led the angels in the heavens in prayer. I am the son of Muhammad al Mustafa. And I am the son of Ali and Al Murtada. I am the son of the one who fought against the creatures until they said La ilaha illallah. I am the son of the one who was the heir of the prophets, the destroyer of the unbelievers. I am the son of the one who is the most patient of the patient from the family of Yasin. I am the son of the one who was backed up by Jibrail and Mikail. I am the son of the one who broke against the aggressors and they destroyed them by shooting the arrow into their places. I am I am the son of the one who is the most tolerant, the most generous, the most benevolent, the most pure. He continues until he reaches the point, I am the son of Fatima, Sayyidati Nisa al Alameen. At this point, the effect of the sermon of Imam al Sajjad was so powerful that everybody in the court began to weep and blame Yazid for what he had done. Yazid became afraid that the speech of Imam al Sajjad would continue and that there would be a revolution from him. And then he called a call. He called the Mu'addin and said, Give the Adhan in order to stop the sermon of Imam al-Sajjad alayhi salam. When the Mu'addin said, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Imam al-Sajjad said, Indeed, Allah is greater than anything that can be testified. When he came to the point in saying, Ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah, the Imam stopped the Mu'addin and said to him, Tell me, O Yazid, 
this Muhammad that has been named in the Adhan? Is he my grandfather or is he your grandfather? If you say that he is your grandfather, you would say an open lie. And if you say that he is my grandfather, then why have you killed his son and imprisoned his family? With this, Imam al-Sajjad was able to walk out of Damascus. They came on these nights. They said to Imam al-Sajjad that the tumult is too great. Tell us, what are your conditions for being freed? Imam al-Sajjad said, I want the following conditions. Number one, I want to be able to be taken back towards Karbala and then Medina. The second condition is that we want a house in which we can mourn for our family members. We want the heads of our shuhada to be returned. And the last condition is that when your attackers attacked our tents, they plundered our families. They even took from us the belongings of my grandmother Fatima to Zahra. Her clothes were taken. Her spinning wheel was taken. We want all of these things being returned. Imagine when the house of Fatima is attacked that even the clothes of Fatima to Zahra are snatched away. But we take you to that moment in which the prisoners are being freed. They are being taken back towards Karbala. We know that there is one young girl who is still left inside Damascus. She is buried inside the dungeons of Yazid. Picture the scene. All of the family members are getting ready to depart from Damascus. You can imagine there is one lady who is sitting beside that grave. She cannot leave. Zainab is doing the head count. She wants to leave. She realizes that the mother of Ruqayya is still being left behind. She comes back towards them. She says, why are you not leaving? The mother of Ruqayya can only say, Rabab says, oh Zainab, where do you want me to go? If you want me to go to Karbala, my Azhar is buried in Karbala. How will I go there and leave him again? If you want me to leave Damascus, I'm leaving Ruqayya behind. How do I leave both of my children? How do I return back to Medina when none of my children are with me? What can Zainab say? What can Zainab say to such a broken heart? We will say, Oh Rabab, Zainab knows your pain. She too has left two children. She has also left Owen and Muhammad behind in Karbala. Ala la'natullahi ala al-qawm al-zalimeen. Wa sayya'alamu al-lazina dhalamu ayyumun qalabiyan qalibun. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to hasten the appearance of Imam al-Hajjah alayhi salam to allow us to be alongside him at all times in our life and in our death. If we are to pass away from this world before his coming, Ya Allah, raise us from our graves so that we can partake in the victories of Muhammad in Ali Muhammad. We ask Ya Allah, there are many people around the world going through such desperate times, those people in a state of war and oppression, poverty, homelessness and disease, disaster, Ya Allah, grant them all safety, security and victory for the sake of Muhammad in Ali Muhammad. Ya Allah, grant us the ziyarah of Abu Abdullah al-Husayn fi dunya wal akhirah. Help us to be able to reform our pulpits such that it moves our community forward. And we ask you, Ya Allah, in the final moments of our life, we die in the love of Muhammad and Ali Muhammad. Matim al-Husayn, Ya Husayn.